All right, we still got some fellowship, and that's good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, so good to see everybody again this morning and uh, back in God's house. Looking forward to hearing his word this morning, seeing what it is that he's got for us. Our, our scripture verse is going to be, we're going to be in the same place we were, were last week uh, with our base verse, which is Proverbs 29, 18. And we'll get to that in just a minute. You can go ahead and flip over there if you want to. But um, last week we, we started a, a little short sermon series on vision. And, um, you know, what is our individual vision? What is it that God wants us to be? What's the vision that he wants for our church? Um, you know, our text came from several places, but again, 2918 here in Proverbs. And it says this, it says, when there is no vision, the people perish. But he who keepeth the law, what? Happy is he, right? So though this verse of Scripture, or through this verse of Scripture, we discovered that the vision is defined a, a certain way. And I got some comment, commentary on this last week, so I wanted to go back through this again. Um, it's the ability to see beyond the surface of human potential, who we are. The ability to, to see between or, or beyond what it is that we are today. It's not who we are as of right now, but it's who we want to become. It's what we desire to be, where we desire to go with our life. Vision is a picture of what is not yet seen, but what can become or what can yet be. We also discovered that God had his own vision at the time of creation. Remember what we said? We talked about three different areas here. We talked about creation. He created even the gnats. Remember, we talked about the old bugs and the stuff like that. He created all of that. He had a purpose for all of those. He, cre he, he had a vision doing that. He also had a vision when Adam and Eve fell when, when, at the fall of man. He also had a vision when the Holy Spirit came and, 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 and filled us with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we discovered also that, that vision gives us a few things. It gives us stability. It gives us guidance. It gives us great joy and excitement. You remember these things? I always like to refresh you so that we can continue going in the direction that we've been, been going in. We also discovered, too, that true vision from God, if it's God's vision, it doesn't praise us. It praises Him and Him alone. God's vision for us must not be self-seeking. His vision through us must... Uh, always be about him and about him alone, no one else. Um, we also discover, remember, we talked about some vision killers. Are you with me this morning? We talked about some vision killers. We, we've discovered that we got to avoid these things. We, we can't become complacent. Remember the C's that I gave you? We can't be complacent. We can't afford to be carnal in our thinking, thinking only of ourselves. We have to be aware of our critics that love to find fault rather than building us up and sharing God's vision. And then finally, we discovered that we must give ourselves fully to God's vision by being, what's the word? We have to be committed. We have to be committed to what God's vision is. We must have compassion. We must be uh, contributors to it. We must uh, be common with each other and having courage being in those communicators. Now, uh, that's kind of a refresher course from last week, so I'm going to move on. I heard a story some time ago that I thought you might like, and some of y'all like this. There was a deacons meeting at a church one evening, and at the table were three deacons and one pastor. The pastor had received a vision from God and was explaining it to his deacons, saying that they should initiate this vision in the church. When they took that vote, the tally was three deacons against and one pastor for. So the deacon chairman spoke up and said, well... The vote is three to one. You're outvoted, Pastor, and it's late, so let's close this thing in prayer. Well, the pastor, not wanting to give up that easily, prayed that the Lord would just somehow show the deacons that it was not his vision that he fought for, but the Lord's vision that he fought for. And at that moment, a lightning bolt came through the window. It split the table in half, and it threw all the deacons into the floor. After they all got up, the deacon chairman said, Well, Pastor, the vote is now three to two. You still lose. That's a shame. That's how it is in some churches. Isn't it? But this morning, we're going to look just a little bit further into God's vision and look at a couple of other verses of Scripture. So turn with me, if you would, just a few pages over to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs 19, if you'll turn with me over there. We're going to look at, uh, at verse 21, 19, 20, 
one. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for, again, this morning, the opportunity to be in your house. Uh, just looking at this little word that we call vision, just trying to figure out where it is that you want us to go as a church, where we should go as individual Christians, and, and how we should put all of that together to glorify and edify you. So just bless us with that this morning. Father, let something be said today that, that, just, that just clicks a light bulb on, that we hear and we see what it is that you're trying to tell us, and that we, we just want to move on in your name, and, and not worried about little things, but we're more worried about what it is that you want us to do. So in other words, Lord, we're asking you to make less of us and more of you. So bless us through this, Lord. We praise you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, 1921 in Proverbs says this, and it's on the screen for you if you'd like it there. It says, uh, there are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. Now, in everyday words, this verse of scripture is saying something. It's simply saying, you can make all the plans that you like, but God gets the last word every time. You can make, say that with me. You can make all the plans you like, but God gets the last word. In the end, his purpose always prevails. His divine vision will come to light. You may not see it because you're not looking for it, but his vision is always going to be accomplished. His will is always going to be accomplished. His plan will be implemented whether we decide to connect with him or whether we decide not to connect with him. But by, connect, by not connecting with him, we miss our chance to see what is our part of the vision. We allow other things to, to just distract us and, and keep us from staying connected and, and tuned in to the vision that God has for us. John 15, 5 says this, and I have this for you too. It says that Jesus is the vine. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears what? Much fruit, for without me you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. It's how they used to say it in Walterboro. You can't do nothing without Jesus. Jesus clearly states here, there's no question, Jesus clearly states here that without him, we could do nothing. Milan Lefebvre saw this many years ago, and he wrote us a great hymn. Without him, sing it. I could do nothing. What's the next thing? Without him, I'd surely fail. Uh, you know the song. I even heard harmony. That's great. Good stuff. But without him, we can do nothing. There's a Christian rock band some years ago named Petra. Petra is a derivative of the word Peter. Peter means what? Rock. So that's where this came from. But it was also called, without him, I can do nothing. People have seen this for years. There's nothing that we can do if we're not connected to Jesus. Connection is a choice. We must make a choice to connect to Jesus and seek his what? Vision. We must seek his vision if we're going to find it. I made a few bullet points here. Choosing to connect to Jesus will reveal what you believe about fulfilling his great commission. Do you want to follow that? Are you looking for the vision? Are you seeing what it is? Are you following Matthew 28? Are you looking at the great commission and following it? Another one is choosing to connect to Jesus will determine whether you will experience his Holy Spirit working through you and changing the world that is around you. Choosing to connect to Jesus will determine whether you will come to know him more intimately as he chooses to use you here at Cornerstone. Don't you want to know the Lord intimately? Isn't that where we all should strive for? That's exactly what we should be doing. We should be looking for that intimacy that only comes between us and God. We have to connect to him to find that. Choosing to connect to Jesus will, will help you also grow spiritually. It's going to help you draw uh, closer to a greater relationship with him. The most important relationship that we have in our life is between us and God Almighty. Now, I'm married. I love my wife, but not in the same way I love my Lord. My Lord is my Lord. I have to connect to him if I want to move forward in his name. 
Choosing to connect to Jesus and praying and seeking his face will help us to realize that his vision that he has for you and your part of the church. Now, God wants us to connect with him, and he wants us also to connect with others. He wants us to, to share Jesus with, with everyone we see. There's no, no misinterpretation of this. This is what we're supposed to do, right? As Christians, we share Jesus' word. We're called to do that. I think everybody in this room understands that. He wants us also to share our vision with each other, and that is for the greater good of the kingdom of God. If we are sharing our visions with each other, it builds, it builds, it builds. We finally get it as a church, and then we're, we're where we ought to be. You see, the importance of connecting with God and others is clear in Jesus' teaching. Let's look at the, at the uh, next scripture here in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, 23 to 25 says this. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is what? Faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. But exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. This tells us that we have to stay connected, not only to him, not only to Jesus, but to each other as well. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, is what this says, without wavering. We have to stay together, for he who promised is faithful. And then it says this, it says, let us consider who? One another. Let us consider one another in order to stir up. What's stir up mean? Get it going, right? It gets us going. It, it stirs up our love and our good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves, as is the manner of some, and I've seen this, we're going to talk about it, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, talking about Jesus' return. We as believers should take seriously our responsibility for one another. We should stir up each other, the, the good works that we have within us. There are things within us that we haven't seen yet. We have to stir this up with each other, and we have to get it out. Those good works can come when we encourage each other. We should love each other. We should love each other. We should encourage each other. We should seek God's vision together as the body of Christ. We should have a far more serious attitude about assembling together to seek the Lord. Now, let me tell you why I say that. There's a person that I know that many years ago just, just stopped going to church. Anybody know anybody like that? I think most of us could raise our hands. We all know somebody that just something happened and they quit going to church. Well, the opportunity presented itself. So I asked them about their absence from church. Sorry, y'all. It is hot up here. I'm just wiping. Sorry. Opportunity presented itself, so I asked him. I said, you know, why, why are you not in church? The, this person, and this was very disturbing. This person at the time, this has been years ago, this person at the time also had a child. And guess what? Child wasn't in church either. That's a shame. The response was, thank you. The response was, well, we're watching preaching on television, and that's good enough for us. Now, I, you know what? I like Charles Stanley with the best of them. I do. I like David Jeremiah. I like John MacArthur. Um, oh, goodness, the list goes on and on. I even listen to some John Hagee every now and then. So you know what I'm saying? There's some good teaching. There's some not-so-good teaching, too. So you've got to be careful with that. So you've got to make sure you're getting the right word from the right person. But this person was not hearing my teaching on this incorrect theology. Okay? You with me? I was telling them, I like these guys too. But you have to be assembled together with other Christians. Well, come to find out, <laughs> something somebody said created hurt feelings 
And they decided that this kind of hypocrisy was not worth the trip to go across town to go to church. Isn't that a shame? Isn't it a shame that we have this kind of stuff going on in our churches? Isn't it a shame that one condemning comment can ruin the assembling of the believers as this verse tells us too? It's appalling that we have these kinds of disrespectful things going on in our churches. Appalling to who, Pastor Steve? Appalling to God and everything he stands for. We diminish God's very essence when we act like children in his house. We diminish the movement of the Holy Spirit when we use cutting and snide remarks to each other. One church member can harm the ministry of the church by not controlling their actions and not controlling their tongues. We can't praise the Lord one minute and then have venomous words for someone else the next. This is what causes disunity in our churches. This is what causes strife in our churches. This is what causes our churches to split. This is what causes cuts and scars so deep that we can never recover. This, my friends, is not of God. God is not the author of confusion. Don't believe me? Read James chapter 3. It'll tell you exactly what I'm talking about. Whew. Get fired up here this morning talking about disunity in churches. It burns me up to hear it. I, I cannot stand the very essence of somebody thinking it's all about them. It ain't about you. It's about God. And until you get on board with that, guess what? The Scripture tells you, this ain't me. The Scripture tells you, you're going to fail. And in light of the spirit of the year and what time it is, my name is Steve Hanna, and I approve this message. <laughs> Verse 25 tells us here that the Christian's ability to persevere in obedience is depending upon meeting with other Christians for worship and encouragement. It's impossible to live the Christian life in isolation. And this is what I was trying to get across to this person. You cannot live a Christian life all by yourself. There are too many distractions. You have, to, you have to stay out of the isolation. You can't seek God's vision for your life in isolation. The basic thought that, that flows out of the scripture is the importance of staying connected with the body of Christ and seeking God's vision. Now, there's seven things, and I'm going to go through these quickly. Seven things that we must remember about staying connected to God and seeking his vision. First is this. We can't do anything, and we just discovered this, we can't do anything disconnected from God. We have to be connected to him. We need, to see, we need him to see his vision. We need him to see his mission for our church. We must be connected to him and to each other here in our church. Number two. If we disconnect from God, we will slowly die. And this is the reason I read this, this vine verse. If we're cut off like a branch from the main vine, what happens to a branch when you cut it off? It eventually dies. Remember John 15, 5? We just read it. That entire passage, verses 1 to 17, describes to you what happens when we disconnect from God. Staying connected with God means that we're praying, and we're praying earnestly for his vision and direction in our lives. God hears and he answers our prayers. We must also love God and stay connected through his love to others through the church. The church is part of his plan to change the world. We need to love others as God loves us. Cheer each other on to do the good that he's called us to do. We must commit to encourage each other through regular gatherings like our services and, and other type of gatherings that we have through the years. Your attendance, and listen, your attendance and your involvement, whether you know it or not, is an encouragement to someone else. People are watching you whether you think they are or not. Then lastly on this, joy in life, true joy in life comes from being connected to the Lord. You see, God has a plan for his church right here at Cornerstone. Each person who is a part of our church is also a part of God's plan and just a small little piece to the overall puzzle that God has created for us here at Cornerstone. Each person and everybody sitting in this room, God has given you at least one gift. Some of you are more than that, but at least one gift 
that you need to be using for the body of Christ and for the community at large. In many ways, our commitment to Cornerstone, listen now, our, our commitment to Cornerstone determines the impact that this ministry will have in our community. It, it determines the impact that our ministry will have in our country and in our world. Our, our commitment will impact the connection we have with the Lord and with others, and it will be either a positive impact or possibly even a negative impact. Now, there's a reason why God's, God's people have a vision that, that burns within them. It's because our God is a God of vision. That's what he's all about. God called Abraham the father of many nations long before his wife ever had her first child. God also saw a king and a young shepherd boy named David. God saw the mother of the Messiah in a young virgin girl. What a mighty God we serve. His vision showed all of that before it ever happened. Now listen, this same God who saw all of these things and all of these people of old sees in us what nobody else can see. He sees how great that we can be in His kingdom. But first, He wants to give you a special vision in your life and in the life of your family and in the life of His church. So over the next several months, I'd like to see us do a few things together that will help us with the vision of Cornerstone Baptist Church. Our vision, first and foremost, listen. Our vision, first and foremost, should be this, to make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's first. That's what we're called to do. We have to reach as many as we can and show them the saving power of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. So we must focus on this vision. We must pray until we see it and understand it clearly. We must ask God to clearly show us His will in these areas. Our prayer time at, at 1 o'clock on Mondays, I'll just be honest with you, it's been a little scarce lately. I'll be honest, I, I'll tell you that I've been concerned about the lack of commitment to this. We usually have two that come. Myself, one other person, that's fantastic. Matthew 18, 20 says this, for where two or three are gathered. In my name, I am there in the midst of them. We're using this time to pray for many things, including the future right here at Cornerstone. You're invited to be a part of this time together. It's just an intentional time that we set aside every week to focus on what God has for us. This is what this time is for. You're invited. We must also possess the vision. We must participate in division the correct vision is not ours it's God's it's only God's we've established that our attitude toward vision must be the same as Jesus's attitude was in the gospel of John chapter 17 verses 20 to 23 and it reads this way I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one as you father are in me and I in you that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may just be one just as we are one. I and them, you and me. That they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them as you has loved, have loved me. And what did that say? Just as you and I. Just as... God, and this is Jesus talking, just, just as you and I have this relationship, I want everybody that is a Christian to have this relationship, together and with me. That's what he's saying. We should be brought to complete unity and let the world know that it's not about us, it's all about Jesus. We're serving him, we're not serving ourselves. Christians who operate on the same agenda as Jesus understand these things as his heartbeat. He longs that the Father be glorified, that His followers be sanctified, and that the church be unified to reach the world just for Him. We should never brag or boast about what we're doing for Jesus because when we're doing that, we're not doing it for Jesus. We're doing it for our own recognition. That's not how we possess vision. That's not how we get it. We possess the vision the way Jesus did. God the Father always gets the glory 
if it's truly for him. Always. We should share the vision. When we see it, when we possess it, then we can't help but share it. It becomes our motivation. It becomes part of how we live our life. It becomes our life. We give everything so that others can see what it is that God wants. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, that he is compelled to share. In fact, Paul was so compelled, he was compelled to preach the gospel. And you all know where Paul came from. He was compelled to preach the gospel. He was compelled to share the gospel on a broad scale. He even, he even uh, uh, asked his friend Timothy to do the same thing. 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 says it this way, I charge you, this is Paul, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach what? The word. Be ready in season, be ready out of season, convince, rebuke, extort with all long suffering and teaching. We as Christians should be as compelled as Paul and Timothy to share our vision with others when we connect to it. Sharing the vision of the good news of Jesus is the most important part of vision sharing that we have. We must also achieve the vision. If we have the vision of God, the first thing that, that we will notice that it's too big for us to carry by ourselves. We cannot carry it alone. As we see it, as we possess it, as we share it, others will realize that they have the same vision and will join the team to achieve it with you and help you carry it. Again, John chapter 15. We are many branches joined together to the vine. Only great teams of branches that remain connected to the vine produce much fruit. The achievement of the vision is the work of the team. You see, when you and I live our lives with vision, it's, with no vision, it's, it's like playing basketball without a hoop. We were just talking about this a minute ago. We, we had a good night last night. We did. Clemson beat North Carolina. First time they've ever beat them in, in Chapel Hill. And how many of you? I don't know. Long time. I don't know why I told you that. It just came to mind when I said basketball. But, but there you go. But when we, we live our lives with no vision, it is. It's like playing basketball with no hoop. We have nothing to shoot for. There's nothing to shoot for. It has no excitement. It has no meaning. Having vision for our lives is so important. It gives us that goal to shoot for. Living for God and finding His vision is, is more than exciting. It gives us meaning because it gives us something that we can accomplish. Just as Jesus had the mission to seek and save that which was lost while He was here in the body or in His flesh right here on the earth, so now you or I... You and I, we are his body. And we still have the same mission to seek and to save the lost. Do you know what your part of the body is? Have you realized what your vision is? There's a contemporary Christian group by the name of Casting Crowns. Some of you may know who they are, but they, they came out with a song many years ago that I thought was a wonderful illustration as to what we're talking about right here today. And it's called, um, but if we are the body, I think that's the name of it, something like that. But the, the lyrics say this, but if we are the body, us, if we are the body, then why aren't our arms reaching? Or why aren't his arms reaching? If we are the body, why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is this, no, why is this love not showing them that there is a way. You see, we are the body of Christ. Our vision should be to reach the world through Cornerstone Baptist Church. We must make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. This is our command. This is our call. This is our vision. It is 2020. No mistake about what our vision is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. By following what God has laid out for us to do, we will see unimaginable things we never thought could happen from God Almighty. He has promised to sustain us 
He's promised us that, that we will bear fruit if we will just abide in Him. We are the body of Christ. It is our responsibility to follow His lead, not get ahead, not lag behind. We must follow His lead and walk with Him. Our task is urgent. Our task is difficult. And our task is commanded by the Lord. So this morning I ask you, where do you stand on this? <clears throat> what is your vision? Is it 2020? Do you know for a fact that you're where you need to be with what God has called you to do in the church? And what he has called you to do beyond the church? There are so many places that we can minister, so many people that we can talk to. Folks, there's lost people all around us. And the world at large just don't seem to care. And that is so alarming to me. It bothers me because that's not the way it's supposed to be. We are the body. We're supposed to be reaching. We're supposed to be teaching. We're supposed to be preaching. We're supposed to be doing everything that we're supposed to do to help bring people to Christ. Can you imagine what kind of revival we would have if we just did some of this? Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. And as I said last week, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, then you got no idea what I'm talking about today. You have no vision. The only vision that you have is yours. Trying to get to the next day. It doesn't have to be that way. Jesus made us some promises. He said if we'll follow him, he'll make a way. So let me encourage you to do that today. Our altar is open as it always is. Maybe there's somebody that's on your heart that you need to pray for, that you know their vision is this close. Maybe you need to come pray for them today. Maybe you need to talk to me about it, and I'll pray with you. Maybe there's a vision that, that you think you have, but you're not sure it's God's vision. We run into that sometimes. We'll talk some about that next week. But come talk with me. We, we can decipher. We can talk together. We can see where we're going with that. But you come today if the Lord invites you to. Let's stand together and let's sing.